So a little while ago, I successfully defeated a restriction that's been bothering me and other fans of the game Legoland for over two decades now. And that's this limiter bar here that prevents you from adding every single ride you've unlocked so far as you beat the main game levels. As far as I know, I may be the first person, not counting anyone who actually worked on creating and coding this game, to figure out how to get around this problem. I don't say that lightly either. In all the years I've spent looking for a solution, no one else seems to have ever figured anything out about how to get around this perplexing design decision on the part of the developers. Even after discovering the relevant memory address that I manipulated to get around this restriction, googling said address didn't turn up anything relevant either, so as far as I can tell, there seems to be no documentation anywhere on the internet for what I've figured out and will be sharing with you in this video. Fortunately, since I've done the initial hard work of hacking the game in the first place, you don't necessarily need to do anything complicated with a memory scanner or deal with another hacking program to enjoy unrestricted free play mode. As it turns out, if I do the initial hacking on my own, start a new game in free play mode where I've selected every item, then save said game as a blank park before building anything, and then share my save files with other people, and you literally don't need to do anything other than open the game and load the save file. So in the description of this video, there's a download link to a small zip file which contains the save game files which are located in the profile subfolder, along with a few other things that you might find interesting or helpful, but I'll discuss them later. Those three save files will go into the profiles folder in the game's installation directory. You just copy them in there, open up Legoland and then the save game file, and you're good to go. There's a provided text file that goes into greater detail on that if you need it. There are a few benefits to using this save file. First of all, you don't need to redo any of the steps I've done earlier with a memory scanner program to get the save file to work. Secondly, you don't have to scroll through the lists of attractions and painstakingly select all 128 options. Third and finally, you don't even have to complete the tutorials or beat any of the levels in the main Legoland story to use all of the items. I literally don't think this could have turned out any better. Although if you don't like having a park named Free Hack Blank, then you can change the name by simply loading it and saving it again under a different name before building anything. So here's my own free play map that I made with all the items. I might have been able to do a better job if I had really tried to think everything out, but this was primarily meant to be a demonstration that this whole thing works. A proof of concept, if you will. So I have all ten of my mini lands squeezed into the southwest corner, and I also made a small pathway maze using the hedges. I'd like to see more people make hedge mazes, honestly. But this one section of the park alone shows that this hack works as you wouldn't even be able to add all ten mini lands in free play mode under normal circumstances. I have the tower restaurant surrounded by water from the boating school, also an aesthetic I like. And I can have the log flume ride with every single attachment now if I want, when under normal circumstances this entire attraction, with all the add-ons, would cost you almost half of the limiter bar's capacity. And then after that, there's the rest of the western-themed area to explore, because I didn't have to sacrifice any variety just for that one large multi-part ride. I also made a sensory coaster. I'm not super great at making roller coasters, and I didn't find the methods for adjusting track height to be very intuitive. Although, then again, I may not have tried very hard, but that's what I've got. Now, I mostly just clustered stuff into their own areas based on the four main themes. But I went ahead and duplicated a few Legoland-themed kiosks and restaurants around other themed areas too, just so no one goes hungry or thirsty in any of the areas. It's rather a shame there isn't a greater food variety in all of the different themes. I also have the power plants, simply because I can, without consequences, so of course I'm going to put them here anyways after finally being able to have a truly unrestricted free play mode experience. Side point, but I don't know why all free play maps have to have this obstruction near the middle of the land area, though. It's kind of annoying. But anyways, I think I've made my point here well enough. I'm just glad that there turned out to be a way to do this at all. I just can't wrap my mind around why they imposed this limit on the player. Or why they made the game fart in your general direction if you try to exceed the limit. Now, I mentioned earlier how I used a memory scanner program for the initial hacking, and that tool can also show you various numbers as well in real time, such as how many points each item is worth when selecting it from the menu. I'll get into the technical details of how all that works later, but for now we'll put aside how I figured out these numbers and just talk about some statistics for fun. 
For example, the limiter bar has a capacity of 20,000 points, so how many of those bars would you need to be able to add all these rides? Well, if you were to add up the values for every single ride, piece of scenery, etc., you would end up with 103,528 points. So you'd need just a little more than five full parks to fit all that, which really goes to show how much of a hindrance this built-in restriction was. Like I said earlier, you couldn't even make a park with just the 10 Minilands, as they would all take up a total of 24,758 points. So if you were adding them sequentially, you would only be able to fit the first eight Minilands before hitting a roadblock, and those first eight would add up to 18,040 points. Now then, we know that some attractions have larger values that fill up the limiter bar more than others. So I wondered, what are our top three largest rides in terms of how many points they're worth? Well, the Gold Wash gets a bronze at 5,130 points. The Adventurer's Plane Ride comes in second with a massive 7,116 points. And finally, at number one, the most expensive slash bloated attraction in the whole game, the Carousel. Yep, probably the simplest and most iconic old-school type of ride you could find at any amusement park, and it costs 7,958 points. That alone is just under 40% of the limiter bar's capacity. Although now that I think about it, carousels can be some of the most artistic-looking pieces in a park, and hiring that kind of talent certainly costs money, but I doubt they thought that deeply about it. So anyways, these three rides add up to 20,204 points, or about 101% of the total amount of points that you can use for a single park. Even if the game was merciful and could fit all those in for you, you wouldn't even have enough room for scenery. As a point of contrast, flowers only use up 19 points, and a water barrel is 14 points. Or if you want to do a comparison with other rides, the Space Tower ride is 408 points, which would only eat up about 2% of the capacity of the limiter bar. The Driving School and Boating School are 759 and 660 points respectively, if you include all the smaller add-ons for those attractions, and those are both potentially much more massive and complex than the Carousel. I was also going to list the three smallest items, but it's a seven-way tie. All of these items are 12 points each, and they're also all smaller components of larger rides, such as the castle-themed sensory coaster. So the seven smallest items are the following. The Visitor Crossing, Boating School Waterway, Jungle Cruise Water, Coaster Track Piece, Low Track Piece, Tall Track Piece, and the Path Track Piece are all tied for the lowest number of points that contribute to the limiter bar. Even if we ignore the raw amount of how many limiter points certain items cost on their own, it still doesn't always make a whole lot of sense in some other contexts. But just to rant briefly about the power stations as a point of contrast first, since free play mode has neither monetary nor power restrictions, it's a common practice to just ignore those two items since they're not needed to keep the park functioning now, so they unnecessarily added points to your limiter bar unless you just really valued them for aesthetic reasons. Of course, the small power station costs less than the larger crystal power station, both in terms of gold during normal gameplay and limiter points for free play mode, and that's a correlation which makes sense. But what about, say, the mini dinosaur? Well, at 765 points, it costs more than the dinosaur and big dinosaur combined at 329 and 383 points respectively, which would be a total of 712 points together, even though the cost in gold increases as you might expect with the size of the dinosaur attraction. Then there's the fountains. The medium-sized one, which is just called fountain, is worth 60 more points than the big fountain, so they're 210 and 150 points respectively, but the small fountain is a whopping 583 points, so that's more than 200 points over the combined value of the two larger fountains. But again, during normal gameplay, the small fountain costs the cheapest amount of gold and the big fountain is the most expensive, so I don't know if they got some of the values for the limiter bar backwards or what happened there. And of course, as you may recall if you ever played this game before, while the Minilands all add a pretty large amount of points to the limiter bar, during normal gameplay, they actually cost zero gold each. I guess I shouldn't complain about the price of free, but I didn't understand that as a kid back then, nor as an adult now. Unless there was some detail of the plot I missed that explained this discrepancy. We can talk about power consumption too, even if it's irrelevant when dealing with free play mode specifically. Excluding the power plants themselves, having one of each item would result in a power draw, or deficit, of 2,826 units of power. 
but since the small power station generates 800 units of power, and the crystal power station generates 2500 units of power, you'd only need one of each of those to power a park with one of everything in it. Since that kind of power setup gives you 3300 units of power, that would leave you with an excess of 474 units of power left over. All for the cost of 85 gold just for those two power plants. The cost of the entire park, including the power plants, and again assuming we only have one of each item and ignoring the fact that money wouldn't matter for free play mode anyways, would be 2,725 gold pieces. And I had another statistic lined up about how many people you'd need to purchase tickets to get that much gold, but apparently the ticket prices change depending on what level you're playing and it took me way too long to realize that. So here's the inconsequential math for all that. I say inconsequential because the game is way too easy in that regard anyways. But it's rather trivial to discover how much gold you get each time a visitor enters the park. You just sit there and watch your balance go up by a certain amount whenever a new person arrives. But as far as figuring out other stuff, like I said, I just used a memory scanner. And I don't want to go into too much technical detail, but keep in mind that going into this, not only did I not know what memory address to look for, I didn't even know that the limiter bar even went from 0 to 20,000, because the game doesn't quantify that information for you. Essentially, I loaded the game and went to this menu screen without selecting anything. Then I minimized the game, opened the memory scanner and attached it to the game's running process, and did a search for all memory addresses that were currently holding a value of 0. Keep in mind that I said earlier that the game itself doesn't display any numbers here, so the only thing I could go off is an assumption that if I haven't selected any items yet, then the value of that limiter bar should be zero. So once I searched for zero and got back an overwhelming number of results, I went back to the game and selected something. It doesn't matter what, of course, since anything will give me back some non-zero number. Then I went back to the memory scanner and did another search for any number that wasn't zero. And of course, I only searched through the previous search's results rather than the entire program's memory addresses again, which is how you start to narrow things down. And I had to go back and forth several times selecting and unselecting an item from the free play mode selection menu in order to do this. Also, apparently several memory addresses are constantly changing, sometimes between zero and other numbers, which gives back a lot of false positives. But once you've narrowed things down to a few dozen results, you can manually remove those fluctuating numbers since the value of the limiter bar obviously shouldn't be changing on its own. So that's how I found the memory address, which was this, by the way, and I only have a surface level knowledge of this sort of thing, so maybe there was a more efficient way to do it. But that method is how I also found out some other memory addresses as well. They're not nearly as useful, but here they are. Also, once you know the limiter's memory address, you can go through all the items by selecting them one at a time and seeing how many points they're worth, which is how I compiled the statistics that I showed you earlier. It was a pain to constantly minimize the game every single time to do all that, but I found the results interesting, so I'm glad I did it. That pretty much wraps up what I want to say about this. I know this isn't remembered as the most popular or memorable LEGO game in the last couple of decades, and it doesn't have quite as much replay value as other simulation or building games, even if it does have that old-school LEGO media charm. But finally, bypassing this built-in restriction gives this software title a little more life, and it's a great way to play it again if you ever wanted to revisit this game all these years later for the nostalgia. So for all of you who do remember Legoland, I hope you enjoy it at least one more time. <laughs>